Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to their DM's Guild review, my written and video view series. We take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Master's Guild website. This video will be reviewing the Tier 1 mini-adventure, A Necromancer's Tangled Web, designed by S.M. Sires for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This review has been sponsored by the publisher, and a review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you are interested in a sponsored review, please reach out via email, Twitter, or Discord, or my submission form at roguewatson.com. If you enjoy the content, please consider using my affiliate links for online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. So Necromancer's Tangled Web is a relatively short adventure, pretty much just a dungeon crawl designed for level four, solidly tier one. Uh, we do get maps, which I'm always very pleased about. The adventure is very straightforward. It does have a potentially interesting boss fight at the end, although I think it's a little... I was going to say it's it's underdeveloped, but all the development is done as a pretty lengthy backstory, almost added on as an appendix, as kind of a would-you-like-to-know-more uh, way of, of getting deeper into the adventure, and I wish that this adventure had balanced that a little bit better and included more of that information in the actual adventure itself because I, I like the idea of separating you know what is let's hit the ground running what information do you need right away versus here's some extra backstory the dm can know that may or may not be relevant to the actual story so i appreciate that demarcation but i feel like this one needed more information in the uh adventure itself and not all of it relegated to this kind of end appendix uh, we're going to go over it and see what we're looking at though so the adventure takes place in Limevale Village which is a foresty village as a lot of villages are in the Forgotten Realms and there's a big long backstory about this poor uh, young man whose father was murdered while out uh, trying to hunt down an owlbear or something for basically political reasons and uh, he was lied to about it. It, it. it kind of feels very Game of Thronesy, which I do mean that as, as a compliment. So I guess early Game of Thrones instead of late Game of Thrones. Um, and the boy ends up being, uh, you know, mocked and stuff because they told him he just ran away. The father ran away as a coward and was killed later, and just kind of has a really shit upbringing until eventually, and he's like beaten up in a date, like it's just really bad. And eventually runs away. And meanwhile, uh, this town is just besieged by undead, um, mostly unrelated i think and then um it turns out the uh boy finds the cave of a drow necromancer who then he becomes possessed by the necromancer uh, and so he's not necessarily an evil man but the drow is and so they're kind of a this dual dichotomy within themselves that's fine <laughs> but none of that really matters in the context of this adventure other than the fact that there's kind of an interesting little twist to the final boss fight but even then it doesn't really matter because you don't really know any of this information it's not really presented to the players organically the adventure begins when basically you come across this city this sorry this village which is now built into the trees because they're just being attacked by undead all the time uh <laughs> move the damn village um and you repel some zombies and, and zombie wolves, which I, I picture the those, like, zombie Dobermans from the Resident Evil series. Uh, you fight those off, and then you track the undead back to this cave, and then that's essentially what this adventure is. It's a, a classic cave dungeon crawl full of undead, full of undead, which I do appreciate that the adventure uses different kinds of undead because obviously we've all seen zombies and skeletons in every single fantasy RPG imaginable. It's just a staple of low level uh, enemies. And I appreciate here that we get a few different kinds of undead. There's uh, swarms of undead spiders. There's ogre zombies. There's owl bear zombies. So it is a nice little variety, but keep in mind if you've got players who specialize in poison damage or necrotic damage, or you don't have any, you know, clerics or paladins, it's going to be a little more, uh, challenging in that regard and it's very combat heavy there's ogre zombies um, here in the A1 which by the way this is the map that we're looking at this apparently was originally a Dyson Logos map but the designer actually uh, went like sent it through incarnate and, and created a nice full color detailed battle map which 
huge thank you for that because this is exactly what I'm asking for. It's all I ask for when it comes to maps <laughs> is just send it on through some nice map editing software. And this is the result, which is nice. We get DM versions, we get player versions, uh, you know, annotated, and then ones that you have grids and non-grids. So huge, huge thank you uh, for providing that. Uh, it's embedded in the text here, but there are separate, um, you know, actual image files, which makes my VTT heart very warm. Ogre zombies in A1 um, with some zombies. They're all kind of gathering bodies around to be raised later. There's one interesting bit of trap in here, which is the form of these kind of blue mushrooms that are called shriekers, which if you get within 10 feet of them or if you shine bright light at them, they give off this horrible shrieking sound. Basically, it's like an alarm trap. So it'll make certain enemies from uh, A1 and A4 come in and, and converge on that point, which is really the only thing this dungeon does in terms of traps. It does, however, have two very interesting environmental hazards, which we don't usually see a lot of in low-level dungeons. Usually ongoing environment or layer hazards are something for higher-level adventures. So I'm very curious to see how that actually works in terms of balance, because initially as I was reading through this uh, dungeon, I thought... This feels very easy, like, you know, undead, even though I'm glad we have a variety, are still generally not that challenging, and this is for level 4 players. Now, granted, we don't have that big spike up in, in you know, 3rd level spells and, and extra attack that level 5 gives us, but still, level 4 is nothing to shrug at. You're, you're pretty competent at that point. So I can't imagine you would struggle too hard against, uh, you know, even, even though they have the annoying undead fortitude, they're still mostly zombies which have really low AC and, and generally are just not that power. You know, they don't, they don't multi-attack, anything like that. No intelligence, so if the DM's running them correctly, they, they can be easily fooled into stuff. Uh, so it's really not that challenging. However, this one, which is kind of almost hidden under the general feature section of smell, says that the party has to make a DC-10 con saver begin to retch. On a failure, a creature moves at half movement and has disadvantage on attack rolls and stealth checks. That is a huge debuff. You basically have disadvantage to attacking and your movement is halved. You're almost suffering like two levels of exhaustion at that point, or three levels. Uh, and if combat starts, they have to make a save at the end of every turn until they succeed. Every single turn in combat, you have to make this save. Now, if you succeed, you're immune for an hour, but only an hour, which means as soon as your, your party decides to short rest, you're privy to this debuff again. So it really penalizes those low con players. I don't know how that works out as a balance issue. I'm very curious to see, um, you know, how much the designer play tested this, and if anybody else has used these kind of, you know, ongoing layer actions. I just don't usually. I see them a lot uh, for higher level dungeons as a way to really mitigate more powerful players, you know, churning through dungeons. But for low level stuff, usually you don't introduce this kind of thing. So. I think that, that would be very, I mean, it's almost like an ongoing, like, stinking cloud or something at that point. Um, although that one, I think, straight up, like, paralyzes you for a turn. So that's very interesting. And then you also have disadvantage on perception uh, because of the river apparently is so loud. I don't think that would play into uh, most cases because you're not, uh, zombies aren't going to, like, sneak up on you. So uh, I, I doubt that's actually going to come into play here. Um, but the, the actual smell one is a very interesting debuff, and I thought that was something that I, I glossed over initially as I was reading through and deciding, oh, this this all seems you know kind of on the easy side given that these are level four players. But then I thought, I wonder how much uh, that actually does screw with people in terms of they have to constantly make this save, and every time they short rest, now they're, they have to make the saves again uh, every single turn. So I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to pass judgment on it one way or the other. I just thought that was a very curious way of balancing a dungeon is maybe you make the enemies a little easier, but uh, you have this very challenging ongoing effect. And I wonder if you could do something like, I don't know, gust of wind or some way that, that players would try to get out of it or, you know, hey, can I just cover my mouth or something? You know, they're always going to try to get out of it in that way. Um, but so that's, that's very curious. I, I thought that was an interesting way of doing it. Um, A4 has, I believe, our only form of real social interaction. So yes, we had an initial beginning where you're, you're, in, you, you get to the town and there's attacked by the zombies and the zombie wolves, and you kind of meet a few of the town's folk, uh, the important people, and they basically just give you the quest to like, hey, can you go help us track down where these freaking undead are coming from and go take care of them. Um, and there's a few NPCs that are, you know, given some uh, details. We're given a few details here in the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then a huge amount of detail for all the NPCs at the end in that kind of, it's not even called an appendix, but basically is an appendix, 
for when you, if you want the detailed story of everything. And it's it's a bit much uh, in terms of how much information we're given relevant to the fact that none of it really matters in the context of the story, except for if the players deal with the final boss in a very certain way. So uh, A4 is somebody they can rescue and they can get a little bit of information from, but not much. The person is like half mad from the stench. Um, there's kind of an owl bear zombie mini boss fight, which is kind of interesting. There was one little puzzle in a doorway here that separates basically the, the boss. So it's a, it's a pretty linear dungeon, um, which just says you have to uh, pick up, uh, what does it say? I, I welcome the dead or something like that. And the, the solution is you have to pick up a, a bone that has been animated, uh, you know, a, a zombie that you previously killed and then touch that to the door. Uh, I am in favor of if you're going to put up a hard wall or door or puzzle to where players have to complete it to proceed, you should err on the easy side for those versus uh, ones that have extra content or side paths or something else, then you can probably go as, as challenging as you want. But so I'm okay with that puzzle being on the easy side. I'm less okay with that being like the only puzzle in here. Uh, and the fact that the social encounter is okay, but they really don't know any much information, but at least we get something. Like that checks the box of like, all right, there's somebody in here to rescue. That's the social. And then there's a puzzle. There's a few of those mushrooms to, you know, avoid. Okay, that's the exploration. But it's like 80% combat because all of those rooms basically have combat encounters. And then the final boss is when things get really easy. By the way, this is a very, very short adventure. As you can see, it's only really seven pages long. And then we get into uh, some stat blocks and the actual deeper story section, which is like another two or three pages. So uh, the, the final boss is this poor young man named Odo who has been, you know, emotionally and physically abused by like the whole freaking town. Uh, his father was murdered and kept secret, like just really, really in bad way. Very much a wrong to dude, and he has been possessed by this necromancer. But the players don't get any of this information throughout the context of the dungeon or through that brief meeting with the townsfolk. They don't know anything and then they make it to this final room and they're supposed to learn a lot of things by having the DM kind of having this character argue with each other, you know, with themselves, which is him obviously arguing with the with the drow necromancer who's possessing him. So you're kind of introducing a uh, possible social encounter instead of a boss fight, which is an interesting twist. Um, so it can go one of two ways. Either you go ahead and treat it like a regular combat uh, or what's interesting is if the players have alerted Odo to the fact that there are enemies coming, in other words, you set off those shrieker things, um, then, or, or if you try to force the door open without using the, you know, proper puzzle, which I appreciate that's always an option, then he is alerted to enemies and you will treat it like a boss fight anyway, which is, may not be as satisfying when it comes to the story because you're really not going to know anything about what's going on. Basically, he's a commoner. He's just a dude. Poor villager. Uh, he raises a single skeleton to attack, which is actually the bones of the necromancer. I don't know why that's a regular skeleton stat block. It could have been something more interesting. And then once the players defeat him, then something cool happens, which is uh, he releases a, a wraith if he dies, but the designer leaves it up to a con save. So it's kind of up to the DM at that point, or, or leave it up to the dice, to either, okay, I want to trigger this extra boss fight here, or I'm going to continue as if you did the social encounter. If you really want to make that happen, you can, in which case they could uh, try and, you know, send him back to uh, town. I, I don't know what would be the more, I, I assume the social encounter would actually probably be the more satisfying but also more confusing because, again, the players just don't have this information. Basically, I was really looking for, if you're going to have a boss that's interesting, which a lot of dungeons try to do that, they, you know, try to have an interesting boss with a backstory of a cool villain, but then they fail, you know, they, they include all the information to the DM. So me as the DM, I'm reading this information and I'm learning, okay, this is interesting, this is cool. But then I'm looking and say, okay, when do the players learn this information, though? How is it organically presented to the players in the context of this adventure or through quest givers or whatever else? And in this case, this one kind of fails to do that because as far as I'm aware, the players don't really have a chance to learn any of this information before they stumble upon this dude who's just arguing with himself. You don't know who he is. You don't know what his story is. You know, it's not like you found journal entries anywhere about how he found this, you know, like, oh, the people who wronged me. And, and then he finds this, uh, you know, amulet. And then the amulet is, is has the soul of this necromancer who possesses him. And then maybe he's got arguments with himself like... You could have, the easiest thing to do is just to include the classic journal thing, which is the most tiresome and yet effective way of, con, you know, I've done it in my games, 
uh, way of effect of, of of explaining that story without having the villain like show up or another person show up is they find like a you know a classic journal that the villain wrote, and you can have the information there. Like something needed to be there where the players can learn, uh, and it's just not here. So instead, you can either trigger a fight here, which is you kill that poor dude, and he releases the soul of the necromancer who manifests as a wraith, and then raises um, the dude you just killed as a specter. I guess it counts as the Wraith can do that, whatever, that's DM magic. Um, and that becomes your boss fight, which is fine. Wraith is a CR5, I believe. Uh, it becomes really interesting if the players are more martial-focused rather than spell-focused, and they don't have magic weapons because Wraiths have that uh, magic resistance. Uh, so that can be a more interesting fight, so that's suitable. Or, or you, the DM effectively you know, has this person as a victim rather than the villain, and the players take him back to the village... And then you trigger this extra scene, which is this Odo's return, um, which is the son of the dude who murdered the dude's father. <laughs> it's very Game of Thrones. Um, so Odo's father was murdered by this other guy's father, and uh, the son now is wants to just kill Odo completely when he sees him, and he orders his like henchmen to kill him. And uh, if that happens, the players don't intervene. Then the same thing happens, where he, the Mouse is released, the Dronach monster is released as a wraith, and raises Oda. Like the same thing basically happens. But then it's even more like, what the fuck just happened? Like we just brought this poor villager back to you know your village, and and he was, but it turns out he was sort of the possessed villain. None of this story really plays out in a satisfying way, which is disappointing because I there are seeds of a good story here. But it's been compacted into such a small adventure that's basically just allows enough room for a dungeon crawl and not much more than that. Just kind of small bookends for that beginning, uh, you know, zombie attack that leads to the cave and then this little epilogue here at the end. And it doesn't have enough satisfying story moments where the players are invested in what's happening. And I get that you want to do a short, you know, dungeon crawl, that's fine. But you also have to pace the the villain motivation and things around that to compensate and this doesn't really fit with that very well so i think there was some good ideas here i don't think it is um effectively told in the context of this story um i think you needed to have some kind of environmental storytelling while in the dungeon and then there should have been some more maybe one of the people like accompanies the players or something and then when he sees odo he's like oh you've been behind all this and you know there's some kind of a moment there where it's realized like i don't know like why do people, what's what's this guy's deal and what's the big back you just don't learn any of this information it's just it just feels like very much like the dm just starts reading this backstory at the end of everything and the players go oh okay that's that's what what happened you know it just doesn't feel very satisfying for the players to get invested at maybe it's a case of the designer biting off more than they can chew in terms of they had an idea for this bigger multi-stage multi-quest chain story but it was condensed into just this relatively brief dungeon crawl. And uh, one thing needed to change or the other. Either the story needed to be pared down to make it manageable for here, or the entire adventure needed to be expanded to allow this adventure to breathe and give more steps uh, in that process. Because this is crazy. This right here, this is an extra three pages of backstory information. That's the designer saying, hey, here's all the story I had that just basically isn't particularly relevant to the actual adventure that you're playing, which that is a, a weird disconnect there. So I appreciate having all this story, and, it, and it's it's good stuff, I think, you know, for what I can read, um, but none of this really necessarily plays out for the actual adventure at hand, so I think one of those needed to change. But if we're just looking at, you know, the dungeon crawl itself, in terms of the the overall pacing it, it's combat heavy but i think it's it's very competent it's, it's a solid dungeon crawl it checks you know the boxes that i'm looking for in terms of the exploration the role playing certainly the combat uh it has a nice variety of undead and that boss fight does have an interesting twist with the fact that it's just a dude from the village who was um has motivation for attacking the village for sure and, and running away but was ultimately possessed by a more evil figure the necromancer and who's trying to wrest control um it's just that the that twist is cool, but the actual story payoff just isn't really existent in this adventure. Uh, let's go over my pros and cons for Necromancer's Tangled Web Pro. A large variety of undead battles within a relatively brief 
dungeon crawl. So even though it is completely undead themed, I appreciate that there's swarms of undead spiders, there's zombie wolves, there's zombies, there's a skeleton, there's a wraith, there's a specter, uh, there's an owl bear zombie, there's ogre zombies, basically every single form, which is a lot better than just saying there's two zombies in this room, there's four zombies in this room, there's three zombies in this room. So that part's very, very nice, but be prepared. This is going to be a very combat heavy dungeon, uh, which means you'll probably be hard pressed to actually get this done in a one shot because combat takes a while in D&D. Pro detailed backstories and NPC information. Well, I, I will include this as a con also, but the pro is that I do appreciate that there's all this information here, especially with the NPCs, um, including at the beginning and at the end. There's plenty of information you need in order to role play them effectively to know what's going on from the DM's point of view. Uh, my con, is, which we'll get to in a second, is more about conveying that information to the players that may be relevant to their adventure. And of course, the other pro is the maps. We get full color maps, including grid and non-grid and DM and player uh, versions. I have no complaints about this map. I think it's awesome. Uh, it does exactly what I want it to do, which is you know, correctly depict everything that's happening in the context of the adventure. It looks interesting. It looks lovely. Uh, yeah, I'm super thumbs up on the map. Uh, con, I tried to kind of wrap all my complaints into just a single bullet point because that's kind of what my complaint is. But I think there's too much story that's shoved into this kind of pseudo appendix at the end. And the problem is it's just not properly conveyed to the players within the context of the adventure. So there's a lot of, of useful information here for the DM to know, but in terms of what does it matter for the players, how does that actually play out? And unfortunately, that really comes into a head at that end when the players don't really give a shit about who this person is and the, the whole fact that, the, that some people from the town want to even murder this poor dude uh, and the fact that he found this drowned necromancer who was possessing him, like all of that is like a huge news news flash, just shocker for the players, and not in a good way. It's just like more confusion about what is going on in this adventure. What are we actually doing? Final verdict: A necromancer's tangled web features a competent undead dungeon crawl and a final boss with a potentially neat twist. Thank you everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewanson.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewanson.